Our presenter today is Austin Little. Austin is a University of Illinois Extension horticulture educator. He covers Jackson, Franklin, Williamson, Randolph, and Perry counties in Southern Illinois. Um, with that, I will go ahead and let Austin take it away. Hello and welcome everybody today. And thank you, Maggie, for the introduction today. So today what we're talking about, our topic is summer garden pests and diseases. And I get a lot of questions, quite a few questions related to plant diseases. And so I thought that we should maybe take a closer look at this topic today. And so as we go through this information today, I, I expect there to be some questions maybe that come up on specific kinds of insects or diseases. And someone may have a question about what sort of chemical should I use or treatment should I use for this specific problem. And I think today, because it, it kind of takes a lot of different clues, which we'll talk about, which we'll get, get more into, but I'd like to maybe take those on a case-by-case -case basis. And in our Q&A, which we'll do at the end here, I think that um, I'd just like to maybe answer more kind of broad topics about uh, disease diagnosis and integrated pest management. So if there's a specific question that anyone has about a treatment for a specific disease or or how to treat a certain pest, I'd like to I'd, uh, I'd like to take that as a I think someone's mic might yeah. be on, which is fine. Let's just make sure that everybody's mics are muted here. So it's right at like Well, okay. So yeah, so as I was saying, um, if there's any kind of question, a specific question like that about a, a certain plant that's got some sort of disease or, or, or insect issue, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to email me those questions and I can get you uh, a range of uh, recommendations and fact sheets and this kind of thing. So let's go ahead and get started. And so what we're gonna focus on today is what plant diseases are, uh, what causes plant diseases, and how to recognize what the problem is, then how do we mitigate or manage these problems that are eventually come up in any kind of garden. So all gardeners run into some disease or insect pest eventually. It's kind of the nature of the beast. And so uh, we're also gonna talk about IPM and disease diagnosis. So as we get into summer, right, we get uh, days get longer, warmer, and wetter. Uh, the conditions that are prime for disease damage and issues increase as we, as we get into the warmer season. And so integrated pest management <clears throat> is an approach to gardening and plant care that is proactive. So it's, it's preventative rather than reactive or responsive. So we're, we're using practices and techniques that are going to help kind of uh, get out in front of some of these problems before they become a bigger problem or we can maybe avoid, uh, avoid these issues altogether. And so integrated pest management is a process where we can where we can take multiple practices and use them to uh, mitigate these problems while minimizing risk to people, the environment, and, and to our pollinators as well. Um, and so these, these, these practices kind of fall into a few main categories and that is uh, biological practices, cultural practices, physical practices, and then kind of the last ditch effort or kind of the, the, um, the, the, the nuclear option is the chemical controls. And, and in some cases, when we use these chemical controls in combination with these other practices, uh, we can have uh, a more effective kind of use of, of chemicals. And we'll, we'll talk about each of these. And then kind of overall, we wanna be monitoring, monitoring our gardens for uh, any, kind of, any kind of occurrence of changes in, in the health, the overall health of our plants. If we see anything weird, insects that, that are maybe causing damage. So just monitoring and taking notes, not just from, from, from day to day, but from season to season, 
and from year to year. So the more information that we have about our gardens and about our, about our, our gardening projects, uh, the more kind of uh, power we have to, to, to be able to dial things in and be able to kind of change things as we need. Okay, so then let's talk about what a disease is. What's the definition of a disease? And a plant disease is a, uh, abnorm an abnormality in the, in the physiology or the morphology of a plant, mainly the physiology. So it's a harmful alteration of the normal physiology and basically the normal function or, or biology and growth of a plant. So something is going wrong. And a condition in which a plant differs from its normal healthy behavior. And that's either going to be morphology or appearance, structure, or function. And diseases tend to occur over a period of time. So it's not something that's going to happen all at once. So, so these tend to happen over a, an extended timeline. And infectious diseases can be infectious or non-infectious. So they can be caused by a organism, a biotic or living, uh, living organism, or they can be caused by the environment. So that would be abiotic. So a disease can be caused by either living or non-living forces. Um, Non-infectious diseases cannot spread or be transmitted to other plants, and they're caused by non-living or non-pathogenic factors. So examples of that would be pesticide damage storm damage, uh, damage from stress of some kind, from a nutrient deficiency, from too much or not enough water, um, things of that nature. So those are going to be non-living non abiotic uh, issues, which are also fall under the category of diseases. They're also defined as a disease, but they're environmental. Now, on the other hand, I think the one that maybe people are have more of a of awareness of are the infectious diseases that can be spread and transmitted uh, from plant to plant, from organism to organism. So these are caused by living or, or biotic organisms. So we call those pathogens. And 75% uh, of the samples that the U of I plant clinic receives are actually non-infectious disease problems from, from home gardens and, and home orchards and these kind of settings. Uh, so the majority of the time, what we might think of is being caused by some kind of pathogen or organism is in reality caused by the environment. Um, and so some clues that we can use here are, so we kind of have to be in, in understanding disease, it's, it's we're really playing Sherlock Holmes for our gardens. And so we take in clues, and, and the more information we have, the, 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 the better we're equipped to, to have a better idea of how to handle these things. And so uniform damage patterns on individual plants and on many different plants in a specific area are typically characteristic of non-living or abiotic factors. And so again, these abiotic factors are mechanical uh, damage, physical damage of some kind, chemical damage, nutrient deficiencies, things like this. And so if we see kind of a uniform pattern on one side of a row of uh, shrubs, you know, and maybe there's a few different species of shrubs in there, that's an indicative sign of something that is uh, non-organic or more environmental. Now, on the other hand, random damage patterns on individual plants or on a specific family or species of plants Typically, that's going to indicate a living or biotic agent of disease. Um, and these, again, might include fungi, bacteria, nematodes, sometimes even viruses could be causing this. Uh, insects could be causing this by damaging vascular tissue. So those are going to be more of the living or biotic factors that we would call pathogens. Okay, so let's talk about what are the causes a little bit more of non-infectious diseases. And we've mentioned a few of these, and these are some examples here. So the, the main culprits here for non-infectious diseases are climate, a nutrient imbalance of some type that is 
something lacking in the nutrients in the soil so the the plant isn't getting its full range of nutrients and fertility could be air pollution and that could also kind of tie into chemical uh, chemical issues chemical damage the biggest one that we see is just over over spray can can really damage uh, trees and shrubs and and desirable plants so those can those can have a real impact on on the health of a plant and and can often those are probably one of the more often confused issues with uh, between biotic and abiotic a lot of times what what is actually chemical and fertilizer damage is is confused as a a biotic or pathogen causing issue and the the real problem there is that that leads people to apply more chemicals into into the environment and onto their plants when it's when the problem was the chemical to begin with so that's why it's it, the, 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 this is a, a very complex kind of thing we need to take in as much information as we can so other issues might be a genetic disorder or physiological problem with a plant so sometimes like any other organism uh, plants can have missing uh, chromosomes or things can get jumbled up in the genetics which cause them to have a, def a, a deformed leaves or structure or they don't behave the way they should and so in nature those things kind of sort themselves out because plants have a very high level of uh, reproductive competition where the most well adapted mutations or or genetics survive and something with a with a genetic deformity is not going to be able to survive in the wild um, but it could also be human or wildlife activity here we see, let me get the cursor here. Actually, we'll try the laser pointer. So here we see, this is mechanical damage, pretty common from mowing and weed whacking and this kind of thing. This is the, the dreaded uh, mulch volcano here. So this is bad because it's causing, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, preventing oxygen from getting to the, to the roots and causing other issues there. So that's kind of suffocating that tree. This is blossom end rot, and that's caused by calcium deficiency. That's a very common problem for tomatoes. And it looks like something caused by a pathogen, but it's actually just a calcium deficiency. And then we have, uh, this is a nitrogen deficiency here. So this would be uh, chlorosis from another kind of uh, nutrient deficiency. And I've got a video on our YouTube channel where I talk about plant nutrition, if you'd like to look more into that. And some of these topics branch off to, to some of the other topics that I've covered. So we'll, we'll kind of stick more to disease today and, and IPM. And so then what causes the infectious diseases, the biotic diseases? So that's going to be the, the, the main the most common cause of, of pathogen or biotic diseases is fungi or fungus. Uh, next is going to be bacteria and insects. Now in gardens, sometimes we'll run into root knot nematodes, but the nematode issue is, I think, more of an agronomic issue usually for specialty crops. Uh, for the home garden, it's often not the problem. There's usually something else, whether it's a fungi, bacteria, or or more often is the case it's a it's an environmental problem and then viruses also viruses are also going to be more of an agronomic problem but again they do pro, they, they do pop up and then we have a few other odd ones uh, phytoplasms uh, parasitic plants but the main ones that we'll focus on today i think are the most common that the home gardener gardener will encounter and those are going to be the fungi, bacteria, and then insects. And insects can be vectors, and we'll talk about what a vector is, but insects can be vectors for both of these and for viruses. And so this here, I'm, I'm wondering if anybody's ever seen one of these. This is caused by a parasitic wasp. And it, uh, it, only, it only develops these in, I believe, <clears throat> white oak, species of white oak. And it's actually not a harmful uh, path. It's, it's really not a harmful uh, uh, pathogen. It's, it's more of just a it's, a, it's, it's a passive host is what I would call this. And, and parasitic wasps are actually good for the environment. They, they control other 
unwanted pests, but um, it might be alarming if you see this. It starts out as a pink ball and turns brown, but it actually doesn't affect the tree in any negative way. It's just kind of a, an interesting uh, gall that we would call it a, a gall. And I get uh, all kinds of other questions. This is from a, from a uh, lilac and it's got uh, some kind of uh, either bacterial or, or fungal thing going on there. But um, those are just a few examples of infectious diseases. And then let's look more at fungi. So fungi are heterotrophs as, as opposed to uh, plants, which are autotrophs. So they create their own uh, food from photosynthesis and heterotrophs are closer to fungi or heterotrophs, so they're closer to animals than plants in that they, they don't produce their own food. They have to go out and, and get it and create energy from that food. And again, it's the most commonly encountered plant pathogen. So uh, they grow vegetatively as hyphae or mycelium, and this would be that vegetative structure, these long strands, that's the hyphae and they were reproduced by spores and it's a complex kind of uh, asexual reproduction that they have um, and so they actively enter plants sometimes those would be uh, endomycorrhizal fungi or there are also uh, the outside type of fungi that affect more of the outside of the plant and those are um, ecto ecto means outside endo means inside so that's really uh, the uh, uh, the differentiation there. And they're larger than most other pathogens in the environment because when you add up all this mycelia, it, the fruiting bodies are, are made out of that. And, um, and so they're actually quite large organisms. Um, they Surprisingly, uh, one of the largest known organisms in the world is, is a fungi. Actually, it just covers a lot of underground, uh, un underground territory. So it spreads out. But uh, yeah, usually going to be larger than other pathogens. And so how do fungi spread in the garden? So they spread by insects spreading them around, <clears throat> environment, weather, they spread by wind, rain. A lot of, a lot of fungi and bacteria spread by uh, water splashing on bare soil and then splashing up onto the foliage. Uh, they also spread by, they spread on equipment, tools, feet, people's hands, uh, soil and water uh, runoff, uh, spread by human and animals, and in propagation they can spread in seeds, plants, containers. So there's lots of ways that, that it can spread. It's easily spread, spreadable, uh, transmittable. And so common symptoms. So symptoms are going to be, these are going to be clues. Now, symptoms are going to be evidence of the condition or evidence of damage caused by this pathogen or this disease. It might be that it's, um, it's abiotic. So a symptom could be abiotic or biotic. A sign is going, a sign of a disease is, is, is uh, physical evidence. So for example, uh, we see somebody spraying a tree with a, with a chemical, that's a sign. Or in a, in a more subtle kind of uh, example, uh, with uh, certain bacterial pathogens, that if we take a cutting of the, of, the, of the stem of a plant and put it in water, you can see ooze, bacterial ooze, seeping out of that stem. Other examples are going to be the, the physical fruiting bodies of a, um, of a fungal uh, pathogen, so the the mold or something like that, or the or the what, what you might call a, a, a fungal body or a mushroom, uh, that would be a sign. But symptoms are going to be kind of more generalized. So that's wood rots, cankers or lesions, spots on leaves, blights, which uh, come in. They look different, come in different forms. They they kind of can cause leaves to crinkle up or or basically die, become brown, or have spots that fall out. Uh, sometimes the, the branches and the, the, um, the uh, stems and things of that nature can become uh, blighted and, and start to turn brown and die back. 
um, blotches, rusts. So rusts are going to be small little pustules. Those are uh, those are kind of the fruiting bodies of, of uh, fun fungi. And then wilt, so just a, a plant wilting and, and kind of um, dying back that way. So it might look like it's, uh, it's wilting because it's having water stress, something like that. But it could be a symptom of a fungal pathogen. And just generally necrosis. Necrosis means dead tissue. So that's another symptom of fungal diseases. And so let's look at bacterium. Here we see that example of the, this is um, blight. So this is a type of blight. And this is where they cut a stem on this tomato plant. You can see this uh, bacterial ooze coming out. So if, you, if you're considering the idea that um, it could be blight, this is a good way to test that. And then you could, you could say, okay, there's some kind of blight going on here. And so bacteria are, they do not contain chlorophyll. However, some bacteria have a form of photo, using a, fo a, a form of photosynthesis where they use oxygen instead of CO2, and those are cyanobacteria. Now there's also algae, but algae are not bacteria, they're eukaryotic, which means they have, a bit, they have more complex cells than bacteria. Um, but, uh, as a rule, as a general rule, they do not contain chlorophyll. And single-celled, they're single-celled organisms and they reproduce by asexual reproduction or cloning. Basically, they bud or divide in half. So think about how yeast propagates itself. And they require a natural opening or wound to get into the plant. So if we have other pest problems like aphids or, or any kind of bug that has a sucking mouth part, those are going to be uh, vectors or carriers of bacteria. So when we see tomato blight, that's usually in association with aphids or spider mites or some other kind, or, or some other kind of insect that is causing uh, tissue damage where then this bacteria is able to then enter, enter into the, uh, the tissue. And they're, they're microscopic, whereas fungi, on the other hand, can sometimes be seen with the naked eye. And so the way that bacteria spreads is through rain, water splashing up again like fungi, infected plant materials from propagation, from, from the nursery, from pots, these kind of things. Uh, again, they can be vectored or, or carried through insects, can be carried through tools that are used in the garden and people. When we're working in the garden, uh, we can move this from, from place to place. And fungi and bacteria both can also live on dead tissue in the soil for up to a couple of years. So that's why it's important to make sure that we're removing any kind of diseased, uh, spent kind of plant tissue that's fallen to the ground and removing everything from last year Put, maybe putting it into the compost if we've got a good compost system going, but generally keeping, keeping our garden clear from, from decaying material will help reduce bacteria and fungal spread. And so common sy symptoms are leaf spots, uh, mold or rot that we might see on, now rot is really necrosis. Mold can also be a symptom of bacteria in, in certain cases, something like downy mildew it's got the word mildew, so you think it's a fungus, but it's actually caused by bacteria. So uh, rot, though, on flowers, fruits, above ground system, above ground tissues, and roots, uh, quite commonly. So this can also this can also um, be uh, be a symptom. Galls can also be a symptom, as as can wilts, cankers, soft rot. So. So these can arise as, as a number of different uh, symptoms, which could be, again, confused as other things. And we'll look at viruses here quickly. So viruses are kind of interesting because they're kind of not quite living and they are, maybe they, 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 they are part of the early, the very early development of 
of what we now know as living cells. So they're kind of the early building blocks that are left over perhaps, but they're very simple. They're, they're, they're the simplest kind of, uh, kind of uh, pathogen that we have. They're, they're made up of strands of RNA and DNA, a few strands surrounded by a protein coat. Uh, they're not able to reproduce on their own and they have to have a host cell. So they're, they're uh, it's some level uh, a parasitic kind of thing. Um, and they cannot be seen by, or they, they can only be seen by electron microscopes. So with a, just a, a, elect, a, a light kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, magnifying microscope, you wouldn't be able to see those. And this is one that's more of an economic issue for um, plants like tomato, uh, cucumber or uh, cucurbits, this kind of thing. It's the, or, or even tobacco, it's uh, there's the tobacco and uh, tomato mosaic virus, but there's also the uh, cucumber mosaic virus. So those uh, can have an economic impact, but uh, it's one that's, I, I would say, not as common in the home garden. So one that you might not have to worry about a, a ton, but they spread through insects, uh, especially things with uh, uh, sucking mouth parts like uh, aphids. That's probably one of the, the main culprits. Uh, they're also spread through nematodes, which are small worm-like creatures that live in the soil. And uh, they spread through plant propagation. So in plants are, are propagated through vegetative cuttings or things like that, it can spread that way. And it can spread on seeds. So, and common symptoms that can, uh, can uh, arise are stunting, curling and twisting, dwarfing, um, odd, odd coloration. So these, these are interesting because they, they have odd coloration patterns or mosaics or ring spots that, that can be kind of indicative of, of uh, viruses. So, so, so these are all the ways that viruses uh, can express themselves in, as a pathogen. And the only control for most viruses is cultural control. So that's going to be something we're gonna talk about with IPM. And uh, just really the best way to avoid viruses is, is uh, number one in propagation using sterile and clean propagation practices, but using uh, cultivars that, or, or varieties of plants that have genetic, genetically bred resistance to, to those kind of uh, diseases. And here's a, a quick fun chart here to just kind of look at how these different symptoms express themselves it, by different pathogens. So wilt is a pretty common symptom that we see from insect damage, fungi, bacteria. So is leaf spot. Uh, that one shares with uh, viruses. Uh, fruit rot is going to be either bacteria or fungi. And these things can happen together. It's not just one thing that could be happening. And it could be that there's an environmental problem that is making that plant susceptible to one or multiple diseases at the same time. So you could have environmental damage. Meanwhile, you've got a bacterial and a fungal issue. So, so things can kind of compound in that way. Damping off is something that is only seen with fungi and damping off affects seedlings, where it basically just kills the kills the seedling. That's that's damping off, um, which is a condition. Again, it's a sign that it's some kind of fungi. It's not a sign of one particular. It, I mean, it's it's not a symptom of one particular fungi. Multiple different fungal pathogens cause damping off, and distorted growth that can be caused by anything really. So that's kind of how these things interact. And then I've said vector a few times, so let's talk about what a vector is. And a vector is a carrier of a disease. So a living organism, in one definition, examples are insects, birds, uh, other animals, people, parasitic, uh, parasitic plants even can be vectors of disease if they're, if they're causing a, a damage to a tree or a plant and, uh, and, and uh, other organisms. So organisms that move from, that are, that are, uh, that, that aren't, that are mobile, uh, mobile organisms that can move around. 
uh, these are vectors and they're able to carry and transmit a pathogen uh, or a disease from place to place. So other definitions, you could define a pathogen as environment or a vector you could define as environmental. So wind can be a vector, water can certainly be a vector or a carrier, uh, tools, soil, seeds, all of these can be carriers or, or vectors uh, of, uh, of disease. And so this kind of ties these ideas together. So it, it, it takes kind of, uh, uh, things have to align. All of these conditions have to align for a pathogen to become successful at, patho at being uh, pathogenic or becoming uh, infective and, and causing damage. So this is the disease pyramid and so to be, for a pathogen to be successful in infecting a host, these, these, these factors all have to be uh, in, a, in alignment here. They all, they all need to be uh, at the right stages. And so there needs to be a susceptible host. So that would be the plant that is susceptible. So plants can be susceptible uh, or resistant. And if a plant is resistant, then it has a lower chance of being infected, even if these other factors are, uh, are are in the in the range or optimal range that they need to be. So there has to be that host and that has a limited resistance to that pathogen. There has to be the, the causal agent or the presence of that pathogen. So that pathogen has to be within the area that it can infect the host or come into contact with the host and it also sometimes has to be in high enough numbers. So there has to be a high enough number of that particular pathogen to be able to be successfully uh, to colonize or successfully infect the host. And there needs to be a long enough window of time for this to happen. So this, is, this also connects with the environmental conditions that continue for long enough in a time frame for the causal agent to cause infection to the susceptible host. So all of these things have to be in play to allow infection to occur. And so it seems like that might be difficult to come by, but when things line up, it happens pretty quickly. And um, they're, 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 they're opportunistic. So they're, these, these causal agents are always looking for a, uh, a window of opportunity. But this is kind of an interesting way of visualizing these factors. And we're gonna have an example here and then a quick video. And so these are the factors necessary for anthracnose of cucumber leaf. And anthracnose is a fungal pathogen caused by colotrot colotrotricum arbicular arbiculary. And it's a common fungal pest for cucurbit, cucurbit crops. And so the favorable environment for that is, is that moisture is critical for, for infection to occur. And it, uh, it develops in 75 to 85 degrees or 70 to 85 degrees is kind of optimal. So when we get into early summer, when we get a lot of rain and then nighttime temps don't go too low and it stays warm and moist within the foliage, and the pathogen is there in the soil already and it's splashed up onto the foliage. It's got, it's got all of those things. It's got the host, it's got the agent, it's got the time and the, the environmental conditions. It's got all of the necessary resources to become infectious and to, and to become pathogenic. And so uh, this is something that I personally ran into last summer at our gardens at my office in Murfreesboro. So we have a video where I talk about that briefly, which we'll take a look at here. Colotrotricum orbiculary is yet another pathogen that may be uh, to blame some of the disease symptoms that we're seeing out on here are cucumbers. 
and uh, uh, Colotrotacum is a is anthracnose, otherwise known as anthracnose. It's another uh, fungal pathogen, and again is uh, primed for the conditions that we've had. So the, the prime conditions for uh, for uh, reaching uh, uh, for for these uh, pathogen uh, infections are uh, weather. So the humid, warm, excessively wet weather. Uh, time uh, enough uh, uh, of a time of a window of time for for these uh, uh, pathogens to be able to establish and and reach infectious levels. Uh, our hosts, these uh, cucurbits out here, that um, evidently have are lacking in uh, in resistance to these pathogens, and um, and then the and then the uh, the presence of those pathogens themselves. So again, and it is difficult uh, sometimes to be able to pinpoint uh, in the field without uh, precision laboratory analysis exactly what pathogen we're looking at. Okay, and here's a bit closer up look of the uh, leaf spots on our melon plant here. And looks pretty similar. It has that kind of uh, uh, angular, randomized, scattered kind of uh, pattern there, which is pretty indicative of a pathogen infection. Okay, and one other course of action that I'm going to take is I'm gonna thin these out. Um, I'm gonna take the vines that are worse for wear and go ahead and thin those out. Get a little more air circulation moving through our vines and you know, with the weather conditions that we've had this spring, these are ideal, perfect conditions for not only fungal uh, uh, fungal pathogen um, uh, infection, but also uh, bacterial bacterial infection. So these are just prime conditions for for these kind of uh, these kind of um, pressures. Okay, so that was a look at anthracnose, which is a pretty common problem. Uh, it comes up in cucurbits quite a bit, sometimes tomatoes, but that was just a little overview of that one. And so then a quick rundown of checklists. How do we diagnose plant problems? So we start with, first thing we need to do is identify the plant. Then we need to identify what the problem is or start looking at possibilities of, of what's going on. So that's inspecting the plant, inspecting the site, inspecting the plants around that, that particular plant. If they're the same species is the same kind of same sign or same symptoms, look for symptoms, signs. Are we seeing kind of the same pattern of, of, of damage or, 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 or um, information there? And so kind of just looking around, taking inventory, looking for patterns between these plants. Uh, so maybe that could give us a clue. Is it could give us a clue to environmental issues or maybe lead us in the pathway of it could be a pathogen. So and then looking if we take some if we have a, a journal, a garden journal, we can look at history. We can keep we can say, well, this came up before in the same area what were the conditions then? So kind of tying all these things in together. Uh, again, kind of, kind of being a detective, um, like our botanist here. Um, and so putting these clues together to come up with a, a better picture, a clear picture of what's going on. And from there, then we can start to look at, we can start to do some research. We can look at fact sheets, uh, plant disease reports, which I'll show you uh, we have a good collection of those through the extension, U of I extension, but every state extension has uh, plant disease reports and fact sheets. Um, and you can look up most of those for free. Um, so starting to look there and that can start to narrow down uh, management practices and what we can, what we can start to do to uh, treat this issue. And so now let's get into integrated pest management. And this is kind of the, the whole tying in of these practices to help either mitigate 
or avoid these, these kind of problems before they happen. So integrated pest management is a combination of methods or practices that work better together than they do separately. And with IPM, actions are taken to keep pests from becoming a problem. So this is really kind of that preventative uh, management. And we're using resistant cultivars, plants suited to the environment. So plants that are going to have a better chance at, at surviving, um, and that's going to be uh, resistant varieties, or plants that are just better suited to, to an area, um, maybe, maybe a certain species, something like that, that does better. And, and just making sure that we're putting plants in our, in our landscape uh, where they where they're going to do well. So so a, a plant that needs full sun, if it's in the shade, it's going to it's going to become stressed. It's not going to be getting the cultural needs that that plant needs to be successful. And when a plant becomes stressed or starts starts becoming uh, unhealthy or or is uh, is lacking in something, that can open it up to other to to diseases to pathogens because again pathogens are always looking for uh, they're, they're looking for the, the easiest way in. That's going to be through a weak plant that, that isn't uh, healthy. It's not, uh, it's not uh, creating enough food for itself. It, it, it isn't, uh, it's, it's not getting its, its, uh, its, you know, its resources that it needs, basically. And we can also do things like promote natural predators. So we can do things like uh, provide provide um, a environment, a habitat for things like um, parasitic wasps that can control a lot of pests, a lot of different pests. There's some parasitic wasps on a tomato hornworm. And uh, here we have a mantid and it's uh, uh, doing something with the locusts here. So, so we, can, we can provide habitat for these kinds of uh, natural predators. Crop rotation between Crop families is important to reduce disease pressure for different crops. And there's a whole range of other kind of preventative things that we can do. And so a lot of these kind of fall into biological control. And biological control is where we're using nature to our advantage. And that's going to be, again, using uh, promoting predators, uh, uh, beneficial parasites that, that are going to be predators of the of the certain pests in our in our garden um, sometimes even there's beneficial bacteria or fungi that we can promote that help make our plants healthier and more resistant to pests and then promoting competitors uh, competitors that outcompete other kinds of uh, things other other path well other insects or other weeds things like that. So kind of um, just removing as much of the opportunity that, that pathogens have is kind of biological control or using, using predators and that kind of thing to your advantage. So any kind of organism like insects, pathogens, nematodes, weeds, bird, uh, animals all have some kind of natural predator that we can, natural enemy that we can use against them. In cases of caterpillars and uh, tomato hornworm, you know, we have the parasitic wasps, uh, but we can also use BT, which is bacteria, bacteria thuringiensis. And that's basically the, the anthracnose of bacterial anthracnose for, for, for uh, caterpillars and, and uh, tomato hornworms, things, things of that nature. So uh, there, there's, there's something that we can try to encourage that can, that can help uh, um, defend against any of these kind of things if, if, if we're, if we're uh, crafty enough. And then we have cultural controls. And so cultural is going to be, again, kind of the, where we're using um, the, the conditions that the plant needs to be healthy to, to try to make it as resistant and, and ensure its, its, uh, its health. So in, in cultural practices, we're looking at 
reducing uh, pest establishment, maybe making a, a, a trap crop somewhere else to keep that certain pest away from our desirable plants. Um, so those are going to be things like irrigation practices, uh, other cultural practices will be reducing, uh, reducing pest problems, um, keeping, uh, keeping weeds in control, uh, pruning, these kind of things, making sure that uh, plants have enough light and uh, nu nutrients to be healthy. So really cultural controls are really trying to just improve the overall health of, uh, of the plant. And mulching is also a, now it, it could be said that mulching is a physical or mechanical control, but I would put mulching as, as also, I would put it also in the category of cultural controls uh, because it does a lot to maintain soil health and soil moisture and it, uh, it, it reduces uh, water splashing up onto foliage as well. And then we have mechanical and physical controls. And mechanical and physical controls are going to kill or exclude a pest directly or make the environment unsuitable for it. So in the case of trying to control weeds, we can use solarization. So that just makes the environment unhabitable for, for, for those organisms, kills off the seeds and it kills off the, the above ground vegetation so that we have uh, a clear kind of soil and we can kind of get that uh, weed seed bank under, under control. Uh, other mechanical or physical things are going to be physical traps or, or um, things like that for rodents or insects um, where we're actually physically trapping them in something they can't get out of. So that would be physical control. Again, mulches for weed management. Uh, we can sterilize soil with, uh, with uh, steaming it or using uh, so, uh, solar sterilization. Uh, for disease management and weed management and just barriers as well like a physical control could be chicken wire to keep out rabbits or, or bird netting to keep birds out and insects out um, that would be physical controls or here we have a weed an aquatic weed harvester here where they're where that's what they use to uh, clear excessive underwater weed growth out of ponds and lakes so that would be physical and then last but not least we have integrated chemical control. So chemical control is going to be the use of pesticides and herbicides, uh, even including organic herbicides. That's still going to be chemical control. And these are used only when needed and in combination in, in, a, in a concentrated effort with uh, other approaches for more effective long-term control. And pesticides are selected and applied in a way that is going to minimize the possible harm to people the off-target or non-target organisms and the environment. So we want to be as selective as possible and as targeted as possible with the application of chemical control. So that's very different from an agronomic kind of situation where, where, they're, uh, where they're going to be applying uh, kind of broad spectrum. It's, it's really recommended for home gardening and kind of the landscape to really be uh, precision applications where here they're, they're precision treating giant hogweed in New York, which is giant hogweed is a, a pretty dangerous noxious weed. So it's one of these that merits some, some drastic controls and uh, because it's a major public health uh, hazard. And so after we've identified the pest or disease, again, selecting the most uh, precision kind of specific treatment uh, that we can and then any kind of any kind of product you're going to use, you always need to do diligence and read the labels. Be aware of the PPE, the personal protective equipment you'll need, and any of the warnings on the product label. So that's kind of uh, the responsibility of the applicator. And to kind of wrap up, we are just going to talk about the integrated pest management principles combined into a program. So, so over time, we kind of want to have this, this uh, suite of, of uh, practices and, and uh, plan. It's, a, it's more of a plan, an IPM plan. And that ties in uh, identifying the pests that we have, 
monitoring and assessing pest numbers over time, deciding if that pest number is at an economic or environmental threshold. So is it at a number or a level where it's time for further action? So sometimes it might not be, um, but, uh, and that depends on what our goals are. Is it aesthetic or are we, is this something in a garden where it's grown for food? So those, those things are gonna be different for each of those settings. And then using preventative measures, as we talked about with biological controls, cultural controls, mechanical controls, preventing things before they happen. Uh, and if they do happen, um, taking, uh, assessing what the problem is, what the host is, assessing all of these, these uh, questions and, and pieces of information, and then coming up with a management strategy that, that we can hopefully turn into over time a preventative strategy to get that under control. So if we have ran into it, now we know what to do. Now we might know how to prevent it in the future. So that is the kind of overview and guidelines for um, an IPM plan or program. And some resources here that are gonna be helpful for you looking at IPM. So let's look quickly at the fact sheets. And this link will take you to this page where we have fact sheets, disease reports for uh, pests and diseases, fruit, uh, fruit and vegetable fact sheets, a couple miscellaneous things here. So let's just look at cucurbit pests, which we kind of mentioned, common cucurbit pests. And here we see stink bug, aphids, all kinds of bad stuff. And so this is kind of an overview of, of uh, the kind of uh, insects that are going to be common pests. And we can look at these fact sheets here. And here we have where we can even get down into detail on anthracnose, let's see if we can, anthracnose blight of cucurbits. And so this is what I had issue with on the cucumbers I was growing. And this gives us further detailed information on that, okay? And we can just kind of go down and pick a random one here. What, what's one that I've heard of? Oh, definitely fire blight of apples. So that's a very common fungal pathogen, or sorry, a bacterium, rather. It's a bacterium. And this talks about fire blight. And, what, and it gives us symptoms, disease cycle, and management recommendations. So those can be very helpful once we have a good idea of what we're dealing with. And this is another kind of, just more of a kind of resource guide for IPM practices. Same with this, extension pest management. This is how you can access their fact sheets. Uh, this is a paper that talks about, if you wanna read a little bit more about susceptibility and um, sens uh, sensitivity to pathogens and uh, plant resistance, how, how plants are used, use genetics to be resistant or susceptible. That's a really good paper to read. And then this is, if, if you're wanting a, a really precision diagnosis of, of what's going on with your plants, I would recommend sending a sample into the UVI plant clinic and they will give you a really accurate uh, diagnosis and then you can know exactly what you're dealing with and this is where you can find information on how to submit a sample and they, they you can submit uh, uh, kind of perennials any kind of shrub or, or tree samples uh, vegetables fruits that's where you would send a sample oh i i didn't have that on the screen here we go, this is the uh, U of I Plant Clinic website and you can just follow that link. And with that, I think that wraps us up here.